Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang damang sankang namasami. So, welcome everyone. Today's session three of our course, the foremost series of all. And we will be talking about Mahapajapati Gotami today. So, as usual, I will share my screen and then we can start right away. So hopefully you can see that now. And yes, um, today we are going to read um, three texts. The Sankhita Sutta from the Pali tradition from the Anguttara Nikaya. I think this is a very foundational sutta to understand um, many of the other texts that deal with Mahapajapati Gotami. And then, of course, we cannot talk about Mahapajapati without talking about the foundation myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And as you see, I have called it a foundation myth, not the origin story. Um, and we will see why um, later today. So that is the story of how the Bhikkhuni Sangha was founded, was supposedly founded. Um, I think it's a very well-known story. I think most of you will be familiar with it. And for that reason, I have decided not to read the Pali version, which I think most people are familiar with, but to read a parallel text from the Mahishasaka Vinaya. And then in the end, we will read a small part of the Gotami Apadana, that is also a text from the Pali tradition. So I guess most people remember last time we went to uh, a lot of lists of foremost nuns. Um, and the nun who was always in the first place, always on the top position in every list, was of course Mahapajapati Gotami, and she always had the same quality, which was being the foremost of the, of the nun disciples in seniority, because it is believed that she founded the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And um, as I mentioned last time, there are good reasons to think why that is a mythological story, and not um, a historical account. And we will explore that a little bit today and a little bit in future session. Um, um, so it is quite likely that there were nuns, bhikkhunis before Mahapajapati Gotami. But uh, what probably happened is that in the early times, in the first five years of the Buddha's dispensation, um, the Sangha wasn't separated by gender. There was just one Sangha and both monks and nuns just joined the Sangha. And most of the early nuns would have been also ascetic wanderers who had been um, ascetics in other traditions, non-Buddhist movements before they joined Buddhism. So they would have been very much accustomed to living a rough life out in the wilderness. But when Mahapajapati came with her 500 palace ladies and Mahapajapati was already very old at that time, so tradition says that she was around 80 years old. Um, the Buddha thought um, that um, this kind of lifestyle was too tough for her. And probably that is why he um, founded a separate Sangha for the nuns um, so that he could make some special provisions for Mahapajapati and her 500 palace ladies. Um, so that is one way of making sense of that story of Mahapajapati founding the Bhikkhuni Sangha when there were already bhikkhunis in existence before she ordained. Um, so that's something we will explore a little bit today. But uh, first of all, I would like to read the sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya. And this sutta is very, very special. It is special for many reasons, but one of them is that, as I mentioned last time, there are very, very few suttas in our tradition, in the Pali tradition, but also in all the other traditions um, where nuns play any kind of prominent role. And this is the only sutta we have where 
we see the Buddha uh, giving a direct teaching to one of the nuns or even to the whole Sangha. So this is the only teaching that we have preserved of the Buddha teaching the bhikkhunis. For that reason, it is very special. And also the content, I think, uh, is very special. So uh, we just read it first and then talk about it. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Vesali at the great wood in the hall with the peak roof. Then Mahapajapati Gotami went up to the Buddha, bowed, stood to one side and said to him, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. When I've heard it, I live alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen and resolute. Gotami, you might know that certain things lead to passion, not dispassion, to being fettered, not to being unfettered, to accumulation, not dispersal, to more desires, not fewer, to lack of contentment, not contentment, to crowding, not seclusion, to laziness, not energy, to being burdensome, not being unburdensome. You should definitely bear in mind that these things are not the teaching, not the training, and not the teacher's instruction. You might know that certain things lead to dispassion, not passion, to being unfettered, not to being fettered, to dispersal, not accumulation, to fewer desires, not more, to contentment, not lack of contentment, to seclusion, not crowding, to energy, not laziness, to being unburdensome, not being burdensome. You should definitely bear in mind that these things are the teaching, the training, and the teacher's instructions. So here we have Mahapajapati coming to the Buddha and asking for a teaching. And Mahapajapati at this point is a bhikkhuni. It's not mentioned in the text, but it's quite clear from the context that she is a bhikkhuni. And she asked for a teaching in brief, and the Buddha teaches her eight things. And the word that is translated here as things is the word dhamma in Pali. So the Buddha is teaching her eight dhammas. So, and as I mentioned, this is the only teaching we have of the Buddha teaching Anan, or especially in this case, teaching Mahapajapati Gotami. So, of course, um, people who are familiar with the story of Mahapajapati Gotami immediately make the connection with eight other Dhammas that the Buddha supposedly taught to Mahapajapati Gotami, namely the eight Garu Dhammas. And when we read the story of the eight Garu Dhammas later, we will see that the story of the eight Garudamas is a much later text, uh, whereas this text is actually an early Buddhist text. So it seems very likely that the idea of coming up with eight Garudamas is based on this teaching of the Buddha teaching eight things to Gotami. And of course, it's much easier to, um, to convince people that the eight Garudamas are legitimate if you, have the, if you have already a story of the Buddha teaching eight things to Mahapajapati. So I think this was the template on which um, the eight Garudamas were based upon. Um, because, of course, um, there is an immediate connection with this teaching. And because this teaching is the only teaching that is given to nuns, uh, it must have been quite popular, it must have been quite well known. So it was probably not too difficult to convince people that eight things, eight Garu Dhammas, eight heavy Dhammas um, are somehow connected to this and are some, somehow legitimate. Um, so we're going to read that in the origin myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha later. Um, and one other thing I also wanted to point out when we read this text is that um, Gotami is requesting a teaching because she wants to live alone and withdrawn, so in seclusion. And the Buddha very much encourages that and tells her to actually seek seclusion and not crowding. So that is, of course, something that is very difficult for nuns to do nowadays because the way our Vinaya is phrased nowadays uh, makes it very difficult for nuns to actually go into seclusion. And seclusion, obviously, is extremely important to practice the path and to develop deep samadhi, which is necessary to make the liberating insights. Um, but in the early text here, we don't see the Buddha having any hesitation about nuns going into seclusion at all. And he very much encourages that. So that's not, not something I want to discuss today. I want to discuss that in a future session, but maybe you can just keep in mind um, that um, you know, this was something that the Buddha encouraged very much. 
And um, also this sutta is given also to, we have the exact same sutta also given to monks in other places in the Pali Canon. So the same sutta, for example, is given to the monk Upali. Um, so we see also that the Buddha didn't make a gender discrimination here. He taught the same kinds of teachings to the monks and to the nuns. Um, so that is the first sutta. And I think with that background knowledge, we can now tackle the origin myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. And before we start, I just want to acknowledge, um, I know that the origin myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha or the foundation story of the Bhikkhuni Sangha is a text that is very difficult for many people. Uh, it has caused very much harm to the practice of many people. Um, a lot of people came to Buddhism full of faith and their practice was going well and they had, um, what if they felt very much drawn to Buddhism and then they read this origin story and they were so appalled that it really um, created a very big obstacle in the path of many people. And I know of, of women who wanted to ordain, who decided not to ordain uh, because of the discrimination that they saw there. I also know of men who decided not to ordain because they didn't want to join such a discriminatory movement. Discriminatory movement. Uh, I know that a lot of people struggle with uh, this story. So I just uh, want to encourage everyone that when we talk about this story, um, please keep in mind that this is not just an ancient text. This is a text that actually has huge ramifications um, on the way people are treating women until nowadays, even nowadays. And this does cause a lot of obstacles for people. So we shouldn't you know, dismiss it lightly. And I hope we can keep that in mind when we talk about this text. Um, and before we read that text, I just wanted to go with you through this small part from uh, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which uh, um, discusses how the Buddha actually thought about the Bhikkhuni Sangha. So I want to establish a little bit of right view first uh, before we read through the foundation myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Um, so this is from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. The Buddha says, Ananda, this one time when I was first awakened, I was staying near Uruvela at the goat herd's banyan tree on the bank of the Niranjara river. Then Mara the wicked approached me, stood to one side and said, Sir, may the blessed one now become fully extinguished. May the holy one now become fully extinguished. Now is the time for the Buddha to become fully extinguished. When he had spoken, I said to Mara, wicked one, I will not become fully extinguished until I have monk disciples, bhikkhus, non-disciples, bhikkhunis, layman disciples and laywomen disciples who are competent, educated, assured, learned, have memorized the teachings and practice in line with the teachings, not until they practice properly, living in line with the teaching, not until they've learned their tradition and explain, teach, assert, establish, disclose, analyze, and make it clear. Not until they can legitimately and completely refute the doctrines of others that come up and teach with a demonstrable basis. Not until my spiritual life is successful and prosperous, extensive, popular, widespread, and well-proclaimed wherever there are gods and humans. So here we have an incident from the Buddha's life that happened just after his enlightenment. So while he was sitting under the Bodhi tree and Mara came to him and said to him, well, you know, no need to teach, just enter Parinibbana straight away. And the Buddha said to him, well, he's not going to do that until he has fully established a dual Sangha of monks and nuns and a fourfold assembly, including laymen and laywomen. And until they are all trained and competent and educated, and practice properly and um, have actually made the accomplishments on the path that uh, they should be making. So this, like nobody had to convince the Buddha to um, establish a bhikkhuni sangha. It was very clear to him straight away, right after his enlightenment, it was very clear to him that he would have a dual sangha and he would have monks and he would have non disciples and he would also have laymen and laywomen disciples. So 
This is also a text that is very well attested um, across the traditions. It's found in, in, uh, also in the Chinese versions, um, in the Chinese versions even more than in the Pali, in more places than in the Pali. So not a dubious text at all. And I think now with the right view established that the Buddha didn't have any hesitation about women's practice, um, we, should, uh, we can tackle now the foundation myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. So, as I mentioned, um, we are reading the version of the Mahishasaka Vinaya, which is in some ways very similar to the Pali. In some ways, there are, uh, there are small divergences. And generally, this text is quite popular. It's found in all the Buddhist traditions. Um, so, we have a lot of versions of this text. And I picked the Mahishasaka version because I just wanted you to get a feel. If you know the Pali version, if you don't know it, you can read it up later. If you know the Pali version, I just wanted, to get, wanted you to get a feel for how parallel texts are somewhat similar and how they are somewhat divergent in some parts. Um, so, yes, uh, this particular version starts out with the Buddha returning to Kapilavatu and teaching um, his father and his father attains stream entry and then his father goes back, goes back home. And that's where the story picks up here. So the story begins. When the king had returned to his palace, he announced three times in the courtyard. If someone wants to go forth into Tathagata's true Dhamma and Vinaya, I allow it. So here straight away we can see that the story is late because it mentions uh, King Sudodana as a king. And as I explained last time already, or we discussed last time already, uh, in the early texts, at the time when the Buddha actually lived, Sakya was a republic, not a kingdom. So the Buddha wasn't a crown prince or wasn't a prince at all. And his father wasn't a king. So the Buddha was uh, a citizen of Sakya, but not the crown prince. Um, so immediately we can see the story is late. Um, and anyway, but then the, uh, the supposed king here in this story gives uh, the allowance for anybody of his subjects to go forth if they want to. So uh, in the Vinaya, we know that, for example, slaves are not allowed to go forth unless they have permission. And also there is um, a rule that says women can't go forth unless they have permission from their husbands or parents. And um, men also need a permission from parents. So the king uh, just giving a blanket allowance to everybody here. So then, Mahapajapati Gotami heard the announcement of the king and surrounded everywhere by 500 Sakyan women, she took two new robes and went out to where the Buddha was. She paid respect with her head at his feet and told the Buddha, World honored one, I have myself woven these robes and now present them to you. I entreat you to receive the gift. The Buddha said, Please offer them to the Sangha, you will obtain great merit. She again said the same as above, and the Buddha said, Please offer them to the Sangha. I am also included in the Sangha. She again said the same as above. And the Buddha said, I receive one and you offer one to the Sangha. Then she accepted the instruction and offered to the Buddha and the Sangha. So this passage here is not found in the Pali version of the text, but it is found in the Pali tradition in a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya called the Dakina Vibhanga Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 142. And the interesting part about this story is that in the Pali version and in many other parallel versions, the story then goes on to say, um, the Buddha like goes on with the Buddha giving a teaching about how to make uh, offerings very meritorious and very fruitful. And he says that uh, the best way to make an offering is to offer to a dual Sangha with the Buddha at, at the head. Or if there's no more Buddha in the world, then to make an offering to a dual Sangha. And if there is no dual Sangha, then to make an offering either to the Bhikkhu Sangha or to the Bhikkhuni Sangha. So the interesting part is that at this point, Mahapajapati is a lay woman. And also in the Pali text, she is a lay woman because it is said that she keeps five precepts. Um, but still the Buddha teaches about giving gifts to dual Sanghas and to, to Bhikkhu Sanghas and to Bhikkhuni Sanghas. 
So if Mahapajapati uh, was the first bhikkhuni, obviously the Buddha couldn't have given the teaching about um, yeah, teach about giving to bhikkhuni sanghas or to dual sanghas. So there is a very obvious discrepancy in our text. And as I mentioned, the text has many parallel versions. And in some of the parallels, they actually turn Mahapajapati into a bhikkhuni to resolve this um, discrepancy. But that, that then creates many new problems because according to Vinaya, if she is a bhikkhuni, she's not allowed to weave, she's not allowed to spin yarn. Like in, in some versions, she's even spinning the yarn for the ropes herself. So as a bhikkhuni, she's not allowed to do that. That's against bhikkhuni rules. And as a monk, the Buddha is not allowed to accept a rope from a bhikkhuni. So by doing that, by, by turning Mahapajapati into a bhikkhuni, the text creates a lot more problem than it actually solves. Um, so I think the best way to read this text is actually just take it at face value and to conclude that Mahapajapati wasn't a bhikkhuni back then. And that then means that she, she wouldn't have been the first bhikkhuni um, according to this text and the parallel versions. So the story continues. Gotami again told the Buddha, I entreat you to allow women to go forth and receive the full ordination in the Buddha's true Dhamma. The Buddha said, stop, stop, don't say this. Why? The previous Buddhas all did not allow women to go forth. The women, relying on the Buddha, shaved their heads and wore monastic robes at home. Striving diligently, they attained the paths and fruits. The future Buddhas will also do it like this. I now allow you to follow this method. Gotami asked him three times as above, and the Buddha also did not allow it three times as above. At this, Gotami cried loudly, paid respect at his feet and left. So here in this version, we have the Buddha claiming that previous Buddhas did not allow women to go forth and future Buddhas also uh, don't allow this. So this is something that's only found here in this text. And in, um, in many other texts, um, it is said that all Buddhas have a fourfold assembly and a dual Sangha. So Bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen, and laywomen. That is a defining feature of every dispensation of every Buddha. So this text here is pretty unique in stating that um, no Buddha ever has allowed women to go forth. So based on comparative studies, we, we, like, we can easily know that this is um, an outlier and we don't have to take this very seriously. Um, so... Anyway, moving on from Kapilavatu, the Buddha went wandering among the people together with a large Bhikkhu Sangha of 1,250 people. Gotami and the 500 Sakin women shaved their head, put on monastic robes, and followed behind weeping. They always stayed overnight in places where the world honored ones stayed overnight. So Gotami and the 500 Sakin women make use of the allowance to shave their heads and to wear monastic robes. But of course, they don't stay at home. They just uh, prove to the Buddha that they're capable of staying outdoors and living an ascetic life. So, wandering by stages, the Buddha reached Savati and stayed in Jeta's Grove. Gotami and the 500 Sakyan women wept at the gate. At dawn, Ananda saw them in this state and asked them why. They answered, Venerable, the world honored one doesn't allow women to go forth and receive the full ordination. Because of this, we grieve. We entreat you to clarify this for us and let us fulfill our purpose. Then Ananda returned, paid respect with his head at the Buddha's feet and told him everything. The Buddha stopped Ananda also as explained above. Ananda said to the Buddha again, when the Buddha was just born, his mother passed away. Gotami nursed the world honored one until he had grown up. How can one not repay this great kindness? The Buddha said, I also have great kindness towards Gotami. Because she relies on me, she knows the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and respect and faith arose. If someone relying on a good friend knows the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and arouses faith and respect, in whatever way they support the friend for their entire life, whether with robes, food, or medicines, they can't repay it. So this part is very similar to the Pali version, I think. Um, and Ananda continues. 
if, if women went forth and received the full ordination, would they be able to attain the four paths and fruits of renunciate? The Buddha said, they would be able to attain them. Ananda said, if they can attain the four paths, why does the world honor one not allow them to go forth and receive the full ordination? The Buddha said, I now allow Gotami to receive eight rules not to be transgressed. Then this is her going forth and obtainment of the full ordination, which eight. So this is also very similar to the Pali. Ananda um, brings up the argument that women would be able to attain all the four parts and fruits up to Arahanship. And then the Buddha um, gives in and allows the going forth and lays down the eight Garu Dhammas here. So the eight rules, eight rules not to be transgressed are the eight Garu Dhammas. So a bhikkhuni should ask the bhikkhu sangha every half month for an instructor. A bhikkhuni should not enter the rains retreat in a place without bhikkhus. At the time of the invitation ceremony, she should invite the bhikkhu sangha with regards to, to three things, offenses seen, heard or suspected. A sikkamana who has trained in the precepts for two years should receive the full ordination in both sanghas. A bhikkhuni may not abuse a bhikkhu and may not tell lay families that a bhikkhu has broken the precepts, has broken proper conduct or broken right view. A bhikkhuni may not bring up a bhikkhu's offense, but a bhikkhu may criticize a bhikkhuni. If a bhikkhuni commits a coarse unwholesome offense, that's a sangha disesa, she should undergo probation in Pali that is called manata for half a month in both sanghas. When she has undergone probation for half a month in both sanghas, she should, she should ask for rehabilitation in both sanghas of 20. So that means 20 people in each sangha have to be present for that ceremony. And even if a bhikkhuni has been ordained for 100 years, she should pay respect, get up and welcome a newly ordained bhikkhu. Um, so this last one means that um, um, paying respect and the order in the Sangha is not according to seniority, but any kind of even newly ordained bhikkhu would be superior to a bhikkhuni even have, if she has been ordained for 100 years. So when we look at those rules, a few things come to mind. Number one is that this is the only place in the canon where the Buddha lays down rules preemptively. So even in the case of the Parajika rules, which are the rules that force a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni uh, to disrobe immediately if they break them, they were not laid down preemptively. So those Parajika rules cover things like killing a human being or having sexual intercourse. So even in those cases, even killing of a human being, the rule wasn't laid down preemptively. The rule was only laid down when somebody actually did it. But here in this case, we see the Buddha totally out of character, apparently laying down rules. Um, preemptively. And then the other thing is also that um, at this point, Gotami is a lay person. And at the time of the Buddha, the Vinaya wasn't known to lay people. Like it wasn't like nowadays where people can access the Vinaya and it's um, all open and there are books about it and you can read it on the internet. But um, the Vinaya was kind of kept secret. Um, because uh, even when we recite our Patimokkha texts, our monastic codes, even nowadays, until nowadays, we have to make sure that there are no lay people and no samaneras or samaneris, that is novice monks and, mo monks and nuns, that they aren't, there's nobody in earshot. So only fully ordained people can listen to the Patimokkha recitation. So Vinaya wouldn't have been known to lay people in the same extent that they know about it nowadays. So we see that this list mentions a lot of ceremonies that cannot make any sense to uh, Mahapajapati why she, like, before she has had any proper monastic training. So for example, the Pavarana ceremony or the term Sikamana and what are the precepts for that Sikamana, like which kind of rules does she need to follow. and um, then the procedure for bringing up on a bhikkhu's offense. Like this, this doesn't just refer to mentioning that somebody has broken a rule. There's an actual proper procedure established in the Vinaya 
um, that is referred to here. And then she wouldn't have known what the Sangha de Sesa is. She wouldn't have known what Manata is. Uh, she wouldn't have known what rehabilitation is, Apana in Pali. So these rules cannot make any sense to a lay person without proper Vinaya training beforehand. And then there are other things also. For example, when we read, um, for example, the, this Gaudamba number four here um, prescribes a full ordination in both Sangha. But when we read other early texts, such as the Terigata poems, or even the Bikuni Pati Moka, there is no reference whatsoever to a dual ordination. And it always seems like there is an ordination. The ordination is just carried out by the Bikuni Sangha in the same way that the Bikuni Sangha also carries out their ordinations um, separately, independently. Um, but this uh, Garudama, for example, gives the monks control over who gets to join the Bikuni Sangha. Um, so that is not something that we see in early texts at all. And also one feature that I find particularly telling is that um, the Sikamana rules, those precepts that I mentioned here, they are extremely different across all the Buddhist traditions. So they seem to have been finalized or even they have seemed to have been developed only after, the, um, after Buddhism sp split into several schools which would have happened several centuries after the Buddha's life. So in some traditions, the Kamanas have six precepts, in others they have 12 or 18 or even more than that. And even those traditions that have six precepts don't have the same six. Um, so they literally have almost no resemblance to each other. So very clearly those precepts do not have a common core from the earliest times of Buddhism. Um, and go back to the sectarian period. So that is another, another telltale sign that this must be a later list. And uh, one interesting thing is that the Terigata do, do mention uh, Sikamana training, but th don't refer to any precepts or anything. So it seems that there was a Sikamana period for um, Bhikkhunis in the early time. And it seems that that was um, um, also was the way that many of the ascetic movements did it in the Buddha's time. So for example, the Jains, the Jain women also had this kind of um, Sikamana training period apparently. Um, and it's not quite clear what that refers to and who underwent that. So it seems that a lot of women did not have a Sikamana period, training period, but some of them did. Um, because Sikamana is not properly understood because that didn't exist in the male Sangha. And because, as I mentioned, our texts were preserved by the male Sangha and Sikama, they didn't properly understand what Sikamana training refers to. Um, we're not quite clear how Sikamanas trained in the early times. Um, so one possibility is that this was for um, women who, uh, like in the, in the female Sangha, there is a difference between married women and unmarried women. In the male Sangha, there's no difference. In the male Sangha, whether you're married or not married, you can ordain when you're 20. In the non Sangha, when you're not married, you can ordain when you're 20. But if you are married already, you can ordain when you're 12 years old, fully ordained as a bhikkhuni. Um, so there, there were 12 year old bhikkhunis in the Buddha's time. So this Sikamana period could have been a preparation period either for the married women or for the unmarried women, or it could have been a training period, uh, an, an observation period for a few months to make sure that the woman who wants to join isn't pregnant. So it could have been a, an observation period for married women. So we, we're not quite sure what Sikamana refers to, but it's quite clear that all the training rules that apply to a Sikamana um, come from a much, much later time. So, yeah. So I think overall, it seems pretty obvious that these um, are later rules. Also, when we compare those eight rules, the Garudamas across the traditions, they're not the same. Some of them are the same or similar, but it's quite common that one or two rules would vary widely between uh, schools. So even th this list uh, seems to have been finalized after the sectarian period started. So yeah, Garudamas are a very complicated matter and we could have an entire study course only about Garudamas, but um, 
yeah, I think for today, I'll just leave it here. And I think it's, it has become pretty obvious that um, it must be from a later period of Buddhism. Um, and was probably put into the Buddha's mouth to authenticate those rules. And the text continues. Ananda received the instruction and then went and told Gotami, listen carefully, I'll tell you the Buddha's instruction. Gotami then straightened her robes, paid respect to the Buddha's feet from afar, knelt down, joined her palms and listened single-mindedly. Ananda fully told her the above and Gotami said, like a young man or woman who is clean, likes bathing their body and has put on new clean clothes, when people give them a garland of champaka flowers, vasika jasmine flowers, blue lotus flowers or atimutaka flowers, they would be happy and take it with both hands, lift it up and put it over their head. I now respectfully receive the world honored one's teaching in the same way. She also told Ananda, I respectfully request that you enter for me and tell the world honored one what I said, that I have respectfully accepted the eight rules. Among these eight, I want to make one request. I respectfully request him to allow that bhikkhunis pay respect to bhikkhus according to seniority. How can a bhikkhuni of 100 years seniority pay respect to a newly ordained bhikkhu? So here, this is very similar to the Pali, also the same simile of the young men or women, woman with the garland uh, is uh, also the same as in the Pali. And she accepts the eight rules and thereby gets ordained. And immediately, like literally the second after she got ordained, she requests to make a change to the eight rules because um, she thinks it's not appropriate that bhikkhunis pay respects to bhikkhus, um, um, not according to seniority. So um, also that request is found in pretty much all traditions in slightly different places with a slightly different wording. Um, but the request is found in all traditions. And I think that is that tells us a lot, because um, if the society at that point at that point in time had been such that it was normal for women um, to bow to to men and that it was normal for women not to expect full equality, then nobody would have questioned this rule. Everybody would have just accepted it. But because there is the request to change that rule, that shows us that people felt it wasn't appropriate and that people had a lot of discussions about this rule. So what was necessary was to put it into the Buddha's mouth to directly hear it from the Buddha that um, this rule applies and this rule cannot be changed um, in order to you know, stop the debates about this rule. So that is why I think there is this special mention, uh, the special request, and then we now in the next paragraph we have the Buddha uh, ex explicitly re rejecting that part. And I think that points us to big debates going on in the Sangha at that point about this rule. And I mean, we have these debates, we probably had them throughout the ages and we still have them now because I mean, we still know that the rules aren't authentic. And so we still um, question those rules. So Ananda repeated it to the Buddha and the Buddha told Ananda, that I allow the bhikkhunis to pay respect to bhikkhus according to seniority is not possible. So the Buddha rejects it and then goes on. Women are obstructed from five things. They can't become Saka, the ruler of gods, Mara, the king of gods, Brahma, the king of gods, a wheel turning noble king, or a Dhamma king of the three realms. A Dhamma king of the three realms means a Buddha. So, um, First, they're talking about paying respect to seniority, and then the Buddha gives this random example that doesn't actually have anything to do with uh, paying respect according to seniority. So what does it mean that women can't become king of gods? Like, it, it doesn't have anything to do with each other. Um, so um, a lot of research has been done on this passage of women supposedly being obstructed from five things. And... Um, it has been proven, I don't want to go into detail now, but it has been proven that this is a later passage. And if you want, you can read up, uh, for example, in Vanta Analeu's um, studies, he has gone into very much detail and then comparative studies and shown that this passage is clearly late. But I want to point out that even on doctrinal grounds, this doesn't make any sense because um, 
because if you're a woman now, it doesn't determine your next rebirth. Like you can totally change your gender and your body in, in the next rebirth. So if uh, the ruler of, if, if like the ruler of God always has to have a male body, that's totally not a problem because in your, in your next rebirth, you can always change your gender. And also, for example, um, the reference to Brahma here um, also shows that um, clearly this doesn't make sense because in the Brahma realm, those are fine material realms, so people have bodies of light and the Brahma realms do not have any gender. Those beings in the Brahma realms are all ungendered beings. So yes, women cannot be, cannot be Brahmas, but men also cannot be Brahmas because Brahmas do not have any gender. So even on doctrinal grounds, the, the list doesn't make any sense. Um, and the Buddha continues, if I had not allowed women to go forth and receive the full ordination, the Buddha's true Dhamma would have stayed in the world for 1,000 years. Now that I have allowed, allowed them to go forth, it has been cut down to 500 years. So another prediction that didn't really come true. It's 2,600 years and we are still here. So I think we don't need to talk about this one. It's like a family with many women and few men. One would know that that family would decline and cease to exist and not last long. So... This simile is also found in many texts, many parallel texts to this sutta or this uh, story. Um, and usually the simile is slightly different. Usually it says that uh, such a family would uh, perish because they might be attacked by criminals and robbers. But here in this uh, simile, it, it's not mentioned like this. It's just mentioned that a family has to decline when there are many women and few men. And of course we all know um, the persons who are giving birth to new members of a family are the women. So one would think that if a family has many women, then that family would flourish and uh, uh, multiply. Um, so the simile also, the way the simile is phrased here also doesn't really make sense. And he also told Ananda, if women had not gone forth and received the full ordination in my Dhamma after my Parinibbana, the laymen and laywomen would have taken the four offerings followed behind a bhikkhu and say, Venerable, out of compassion for me, accept these offerings. When they would have come through their gates and seen him, they would have pulled his arm and said, Venerable, have compassion for me. Please sit down here for a while and let me get some peace. If they had met him on the road, they all would have let down their hair, wiped the bhikkhu's feet and spread it out to let him step on it. Now that I have allowed the going forth, these things are in danger of ceasing. So, I don't know, we have many lay people here on the course. So, I don't know if you ever felt like letting down your hair, wiping a bhikkhu's feet with it, and then letting a bhikkhu step on your head, on your hair. So, um, I don't know. And I don't know if any bhikkhu would actually feel that that was kind of an appropriate behavior, or if any bhikkhu actually wants you to pull their arm. Um, it, it, it's really a very bizarre part of this story and actually, and those similes are not found in any other tradition. These are unique to um, this version here. So apparently, I don't know, whoever came up with this text thought that this would be desirable to have. Um, and now, now they're not getting that anymore. So it's just a really bizarre passage. Really funny, but really bizarre. So when Ananda heard this, he felt sadness and regret and tears flowed. He told the Buddha, world honored one, I earlier had not heard and did not know about this matter when I asked you to allow women to go forth and receive the full ordination. If I had known this earlier, how could I have made three requests? The Buddha told Ananda, don't weep anymore. Mara had clouded your mind, therefore you did this. Now that I have allowed women to go forth and receive the full ordination, one should follow what I have laid down, one may not depart from it. What I have not laid down, one may not wrongly lay down. Then Ananda went out and fully told Gotami about the Buddha's instruction. Gotami was happy and received it respectfully. Then her going forth and reception of the full ordination were completed. So I feel like this last passage here is also very important in my mind. I feel like after having read this passage, the whole text makes a lot more sense to me. Um, because what this text, like this last bit, he seems to say is that now that the Buddha has allowed women to go forth, uh, people shouldn't question it anymore. 
Um, people should follow what he has laid down. So people should support Bikunis and uh, should accept their right to exist and um, support that practice. And you may not depart from it. So um, yeah, you shouldn't create obstacles for Bikunis and you also should not lay down anything um, wrongly that, um, you know, obstructs Bikunis, the Bikuni Sangha. So I feel like um, after reading this last passage, um, what, what it seems to me is that this text is a kind of compromise text um, between the different groups in the Bhikkhu Sangha. So as we mentioned in the introduction, after the Buddha's Parinibbana, there were different groups in the Bhikkhu Sangha. And some of them very much opposed to Bhikkhunis and others were uh, very much in favor. And what probably happened with this text here is that um, they came to some sort of compromise whereby the Bhikkhunis were subordinate to the monks, but in exchange, the monks no longer opposed, no longer fully opposed to the Bhikkhunis being present at all and started to be somewhat supportive of their practice. So that, that is what I am getting from this last passage of the text. Um, that is how I make sense of this whole story. And yeah, so that is the foundation myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. We've picked it apart a little bit. And um, we are nearing, uh, I'm kind of using up, I've already used up all the time we have for today, but uh, I will just take on two more minutes to go through the small part of the Gotami Apadana because I feel like this uh, is also very important to understand what was going on back then. And this is, uh, provides a really big counterpoint to uh, the story we just read. So the Gotami Apadana, um, explains the or tells the story of the passing away the parinibbana of Mahapajapati Gotami and we pick up the story here towards the end when she has already entered parinibbana and then the teacher told Ananda whose knowledge was deep as the sea go now Ananda tell the monks my mother has reached nirvana then Ananda who had who'd lost his joy whose eyes were filling up with tears announced while choking on his words Come together, O Buddhist monks, who are residing in the north or in the east or south or west. Let them all listen to my words, monks who are the well gone ones' heirs. This Gotami, who carefully reared up the body of the sage, has gone to peace, no longer seen, just like stars when the sun rises. She has gone home, leaving behind her designation Buddha's mother, where even he, the five eyed one, the leader, cannot see one gone. Each with faith in the well gone one and each of the sages' pupils ought now to come that Buddha's son to honor the Buddha's mother. Hearing that, the monks came with speed, even those living far away. Some came by Buddha's majesty, some were skilled in superpowers. I left out a small bit here. And the text continues. With the gods and people out front, the snake gods, titans and brahmas, and next with followers, Buddha, process to worship his mother. The Buddha's final nirvana was not, as, not of such a kind as this. Gotami's final nirvana was extremely miraculous. So in this text here, we get a very different attitude of monks towards nuns. Uh, for example, here, everybody, has, uh, everybody comes together uh, when Mahapajabati has passed away and the Buddha calls everybody in order to um, honor the Buddha's mother, so to pay respect to a bhikkhuni. So the monks come and pay respect to a bhikkhuni. And then again here, even the Buddha himself uh, worshiped his mother together with all the followers, with all the other bhikkhus. And then the text concludes by saying even the Buddha's own final nirvana was not uh, so miraculous as the one, uh, as Mahapajapati Gotami's one. So this text obviously has a very, very different attitude towards women, towards bhikkhunis. And it's interesting because both the Apadana and that Vinaya text come from the centuries after the Buddha's life. Um, so they, they come from sort of rough, like we can't properly date them, but they come from roughly the same time period. And to me, that again exemplifies the, the different groups in the Sangha as I mentioned, and we talked about it um, 
already. So that there was a group in the Sangha that uh, was kind of the ascetic group. They were very reclusive, withdrawn from society. And those were the groups also that practiced Vinaya very strictly and that were somewhat opposed uh, to um, Bhikkhunis. And so it's quite normal that those would be the groups who would um, preserve the Vinaya texts and who would develop the Vinaya texts. So the uh, origin myth of the Bhikkhuni Sangha would be, is, that is a Vinaya text. So that would be a text that would be under those monks. But the Gotami Apadang, uh, or, but the other group of monks were monks who were much more uh, socially engaged, much more involved with lay people, teaching lay people much more. And those are, are also the groups that are more, uh, more supportive of Bhikkhunis. And of course, Apadana texts are texts that are developed for lay people, um, to teach lay people and to inspire lay people. Um, so of course, um, that socially engaged group of monks would be the kind of monks who are um, guardians of so, such Apadana texts. So of course, they have a very different attitude towards women. So I feel like from these texts also, we can see again, those different um, groups and different tendencies and different priorities in the Sangha. And the only way to make sense of those really, um, or, or, the only way to make sense of the texts that deal with women in our Buddhist traditions is by acknowledging that there were different groups of monks and they had different interests. Because otherwise we just see all the texts and they're all, um, they all contradict each other and we cannot, see any kind of clear attitude towards women and we just don't know what to make of this. So uh, I feel it's very, in, very important to understand the dynamics in the monk Sangha at uh, those points in time in order to make sense of the texts uh, that deal with women. Um, and um, with, on that note, I think I'm going to end for today. Um, I hope uh, you like the presentation. I hope you learned a little bit. And if you have any comments or questions, then now is a good time to ask. And you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in the live chat in, in the chat if you don't want to speak. So I see someone else has typed in the chat. Hello, Ashok, nice to see you. Great to have you join in from Malaysia. I have a question. Okay. Um, thank you for this. Um, I think it's really interesting to think of the, some of the sutras as like the evidence of like a compromise, like a political compromise. And I'm wondering, is there any, um, is there any evidence that like in the first councils, there was a women's council where like the, nuns are also reciting the suttas and setting them down or it just seems like because when I when I think of the 500 it seems like uh, what it you know it, like was there a council of 500 nuns mm -hmm. so, but I know that there's prob it's probably yeah. difficult to like have any yeah. evidence of that, so just curious yeah so so to my knowledge we don't have any kind of evidence for that at all um we have uh, we have um, evidence of nuns actually learning and memorizing the text, but they seem to have memorized the texts that, that were collected by the monks. So, um, yeah, we don't have any evidence for a council by the nuns. Also, as I mentioned in uh, our introduction session towards the end, uh, when we read the Mahapajapati Gotami Apadana, and if that Apadana has a historical kernel, then it seems that the nuns Sangha was. Um, greatly diminished at the time of the first council. So a lot of nuns entered Parinibbana together with Mahapajapati, including senior teachers. So it, it's quite possible that the nuns Sangha wouldn't have been in a particularly strong position uh, at the time of the first council. And maybe they weren't able to um, organize big events like that. And um, yeah, so we, we don't really have evidence for that, but in some ways, it is likely that the nuns would have at least preserved their own vinaya in the early times. Um, just because our vinaya that we have now is so incomplete that it seems very unlikely that the early nuns would have um, practiced only with that much. Like they must, have their, they must have had their own tradition that would have had a lot more details about our vinaya rules 
and for example about the sikamana training that i mentioned which we like um, don't know much about nowadays um so especially in terms of vinaya they probably would have had a lot um a lot more um, knowledge and a lot but maybe it maybe it wasn't like standardized in the same way that the monks uh, standardized um, their text and um, also we see from the Teligata how much um how, what like one thing we see there is that nuns often quote verses from other nuns so they quote teachings from other nuns so it seems that they did have their own oral tradition where they learned like teachings from others and then um pass them on to um to like their own students and so on in, in the form of those verses and it, it's possible that they also preserved some sutta teachings but yeah they didn't they didn't survive throughout the centuries and millennia so we, we don't really have them now uh, unfor really unfortunately Arushi, I cannot hear you. You have to unmute. Okay. Where can you find the Padana Sutta? Ah, you can find it on Sutta Central. Um, okay. I can send you a link by email. Yeah. Please. So, is there any other question? Vanessa? I have a question. Okay. Yes. Um, I think you made such a good case. I haven't heard anybody present the material as well as I think you just did today. Um, and I am wondering when you're going to write this. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would really like you to write what you just did. I think that was a brilliant presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I had I haven't given it much thought actually, so I, I'm not sure if I'm going to write this. Um, it is. It is. Very I think you have to write it. <laughs> I think that was excellent, and I had never heard anyone present the Garu Dharmas as being kind of based on that Anguttara Nikaya passage as an argument. I you, you really surprised me with that, and I thought that was so smart. So I would love yeah. to see this written. Yeah, I, like I noticed it at, it at some point and I, I kind of made the connection and I, 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 I never read it anywhere. So I'm not sure no. why nobody has noticed it before because it's kind of so obvious. Um, I never thought of it until you said it and I was looking at it. I was like, you can't be serious. How did we all miss that? Yeah. It's, you have to write it. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. Okay, we can talk about it, but I want you to write it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay, if there's no other question, I think we can end for today. And as usual, we will end with uh, three sadhus. Join me if you want to. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I hope to see you all next time.